I'm a scenic sculptor and scenic artist and prop maker and model maker. I make things usually for films and TV, but I also do a lot of work for museums when I get the chance to. I sort of meandered into the job a bit. I spent 14 years doing painting and illustrating and then sidestepped into prop making and model making, which I've been doing for just over 12 years now. At Bristol Museum, the first thing I think I made for them was a pliosaurus skull. I've done some patches of dinosaur skin for them, some large reconstructions, and this is the latest, which is a reconstruction of a skull that Mary Anning found when she was 14, and she is pretty much the mother of British paleontology. Having the full-size thing in front of you is much more impressive than just seeing a digital reconstruction of it, and you can actually see the space that it's in. One of the other reconstructions I did for Bristol was a pliosaurus that was eight and a half meters long, um, and that's now hanging up in the rear gallery in the museum. And I think actually seeing the thing and realizing how huge it was, and with this one, seeing that the jaws are more or less the same size as I am, you get a feeling for the animal more than you would do if you just saw a picture. So uh, the museum are very good at providing as much research images as they can. So I had photos of fossils of related species, photos of fossils of this particular species, uh, which is Temnodontosaurus platyodon. I had some quite nice drawings, but they were scientific illustrations. So it's, it's a line drawing. You get a dorsal view and a lateral view, um, which you then have to extrapolate out a little bit and try and get the 3D shape from that. A lot of backwards and forwards with the paleontologists at the museum, with Dean Lomax in particular. So we, we had various Zoom calls, uh, where I had this in the background, pointing at things. But I think with this sort of thing, it, it's, it's important to get it as accurate as possible. With this particular skull, the difficulty that we had is that because it will be used as a teaching aid, it needs to be quite robust because people will end up touching it. So that there, there are areas inside the skull, which are much more developed on this model than they should be. There's a, an interesting mid-ground between scientific accuracy and artistic representation that you have to, to get, and I think everyone involved in it wanted it to be as accurate as possible, but you, you have to sort of have the occasional compromise. It's a high-density polystyrene base, which is very easy to sculpt. You can get reasonably fine detail into it. And then it's got glass fibre tissue on top of that with jesmonite, which is an acrylic resin, much nicer to use than epoxy resin, which is smelly and horrible and sticky. But jesmonite, one of the lovely things about it is that it does come out with this bone-like texture, almost without you trying to do anything to it. But then as it's beginning to go off and stiffen up, you can start putting bone texture into it more. So the sutures are all kind of etched into the surface as it's drying. I think now there are far more university courses that you can actually concentrate on prop making or on uh, scenic painting. A lot of the people I work with in Wales have actually come from Cardiff University and they have a specific degree for it. A lot of the older people like myself who work there, we have had a much more meandering path to get where we are and I think probably make things up a bit on the fly more than if we actually properly studied it, but you end up more or less in the same place.